Okay, so Hare Krishna, dear ladies, welcome to the November Urban Devi Sangha and Women's Discussion Group. A special welcome to those joining us for the first time. Uh, my name is Damodar Priya Devi Dasi, and we are very, very excited to welcome you. So as I said, for those of you joining us for the first time, please write in the chat so we can all say hello, because we're always happy to have newcomers here. So as I said, my name is Damodar Priya Devidasi, and I co-host this monthly gathering with our dear Rukmini Walker and Surabi Govinda Devidasi. So let me introduce our guest speaker for today, which we're super excited about. So today we have Chitti Shakti Devidasi, and she's going to be speaking on transforming and transcending everyday trauma. So all trauma causes some destabilizing in our sense of identity, and she's going to be helping us in this session find out how we can transform and rise above everyday trauma to heal, grow, and deepen our connection with ourselves, others, and divinity. And let me just share a little bit about our speaker, Shiti Shakti Devitasi, is a dynamic leader and a powerhouse of spiritual inspiration who is very dear to countless devotees worldwide. She is a disciple of Srila Bhakti Tirtha Swami and has been practicing and teaching Bhakti Yoga for over 25 years. She's based in London, UK, and is a consultant psychiatrist and broadcaster. And she's well known for her spiritual commentary on mental health and current affairs on BBC Radio 4 and World, Wisdom, World of Wisdom BBC World Service. So her wisdom reaches a global audience and we are very blessed to have her here today. So thank you again for joining us, Shiti Shakti Devitasi. The floor is yours. Thank you. You're muted. You just have to mute yourself. <laughs> I'm just saying, Hare Krishna, everybody. Good morning to you. It's uh, late in the afternoon uh, for us here. I'm uh, I'm in London at the moment. It's already dark. <laughs> it's probably bright for all of you. It's so nice to uh, to be joining you again. It's been some time, and uh, you know, I can see the enthusiasm and I already appreciate that lots of you have your cameras on. So that makes a big difference because it somehow removes the distance created by the screen. Um, I'd like to start with some prayers, if that's okay with all of you. We'll start with Mangalarchanam. If any of you are new, uh, we are essentially just making a connection through prayer with those many wonderful souls who are always our well wishes and through whose kindness we have access to understanding more about both our human self and our divine self. So if you know the prayers, please join in on your side. Om Agyan Timurandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Dasmai Shri Guruve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Atapadakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahaguna Ragunatam Vitam Dham Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Pada Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrinda Vineshwari Vishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priya Pancha Kapa Turibhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasati Gaurabhatta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 
कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे सो नाइस टू सी ऑल ऑफ दिस ब्यूटीफुल फल्जेंट पर्सनालिटीज सो um today's topic that i've been invited to share is how we can overcome and transform everyday trauma most of us when we hear the word trauma we think of a something that's a very significant and distressing event and usually something that somebody's directly experienced and has also had a very strong response to that's usually when we use the word trauma i think that's how it's colloquially understood but i want to use this session to help us to really understand a bit more about what actually trauma is and how it actually affects us not just our human sense of self but how it can also have an impact uh on us in our spiritual journeys and our spiritual understanding of ourselves i just wanted to have a little show of hands if possible if you're new altogether and you've never been on this platform or any of these talks before are you able to just give a little raise your hand using the the function on the screen on your screens it would just be helpful okay there's three of you ananga martin and geeta okay um and when you when sorry to further question when you say you're new is it your first time just to this kind of okay there's a few of you so your first time just to this type of session or is it your first time speaking about the bhakti hearing about the bhakti tradition um i guess let me ask you put your hands down if you've heard of the bhakti tradition before uh, and are familiar with it if you just help me okay all right okay martin welcome <laughs> uh please be safe driving okay so this whole idea of uh trauma this word trauma is actually it's a greek word it means wound it means wound and when we often think of a wound we think of wounding the body that the body's wounded you know i've suffered some injury to the body more and more recently people are familiar with trauma to the mind and our emotions uh through our experiences and how that can affect our thinking the way we perceive uh the way we have hold our world view the way we see ourselves trauma also these wounds can affect uh our social roles and relationships but trauma on some level you know trauma our, our sense of spiritual self can also not be you know krishna talks about you know vedic texts talk about how the spiritual self can't be burned wet destroyed in fact in the bhagavad gita krishna talks about how the soul the spiritual sense of self is eternal eternally blissful eternally wise and eternally connected so while directly our spiritual nature can't be wounded certainly the impact wounds have on our social physical and psychological self can impair how we relate to or how we connect with the divinity within us divinity in others and even divinity himself um the source of love why look at it in terms of everyday trauma spiritual people are eternal optimists i find we often talk about everything every moment every experience is an opportunity for growth if something's an opportunity for growth that means there's some power there but whether we use the situation or experience for growth or whether that same situation ends up wounding us is very much a matter of our vision very much a matter of our vision and how we understand what's happening to us and why it's happening to us and you know, for me personally this is where i find that uh, devotional traditions like the bhakti tradition spiritual traditions and seeing our life events and ourselves through the eyes of a 360 360 degree approach to who we are the spiritual and the human helps to take 
every situation in a way that's an opportunity where that power doesn't necessarily, the power of that situation doesn't necessarily flip and mean that our vulnerabilities then cause that situation to become a trauma. Now, I want to actually maybe reflect this importance of this understanding that we have two sides to our nature, the human nature and the spiritual nature, based on something that Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita to Arjun in the seventh chapter. This is the sixth verse. I'm just going to share my screen with you just to show you the verse so you can lay eyes on this. Um, you know, many of us here may not be familiar with Sanskrit, you know, language is very powerful. Sound vibration is very powerful. Sound is always communicating something, even when we don't understand it. And ancient languages like Sanskrit, they speak to the most ancient parts of ourself. Because somewhere within us, we recognize these words. So Krishna says to Arjun, Etad yunini bhutani sarvaniti upadharaya aham kritsnasya jagataha prabhavaha pralayas tatha he tells Arjun that all created beings have their source in these two natures. Of all that is material and all that is spiritual in this world, know for certain that I am both the origin and the dissolution. And it's a very short purport that I'd like to share from Srila Prabhupada, who, as many of you know, is uh, the teacher of our very dear Rukmini Prabhu. So everything that exists is a product of matter and spirit. Spirit is the basic field of creation, and matter is created by spirit. Spirit is not created at a certain stage of material development. Rather, this material world is manifested only on the basis of spiritual energy. This material body is developed because spirit is present within matter. A child grows gradually to boyhood and then to manhood because that superior energy, spirit soul, is present. Similarly, the entire cosmic manifestation of the gigantic universe is developed because of the presence of the super soul, Vishnu. Therefore, spirit and matter, which combine to manifest this gigantic universal form, are originally two energies of the Lord. And consequently, the Lord is the original cause of everything. A fragmental part and parcel of the Lord, namely the living entity, may be the cause of a big skyscraper, a big factory, or even a big city. But he cannot be the cause of a big universe. The cause of the big universe is the big soul, or the super soul. And Krishna, the supreme, is the cause of both the big and small souls. Therefore, he is the original cause of all causes. This is confirmed in the Katha Upanishad 2.2.13, Nityo Nityanam Chetana, Chetanas Chetanam. Why did I share this verse? Before we get into topics of human nature versus divine nature, it can be very helpful to have an anchor for where wisdom like that comes from. We're, we're really fortunate in many ways, although social media has its many, many vulnerabil vulnerabilities, it's also opened up um, access to wisdom. But because it's so fast-paced, we get bite-sized bits of wisdom. We don't always get where the roots are and when we go to the roots of something we're able to really dive deep into it more in our human nature you know we connect our, our desire is to connect our spiritual nature is to be eternally wise and blissfully connected and so we also seek these things out in our human existence day to day you know we connect with others we connect with our surroundings. We try to create relationships with others which are harmonious and joyful. We try to create surroundings which are harmonious and uh, joyful. We may move countries for better weather. Okay, we may take out loans to make our homes more comfortable, right? We, um, we even create a very strong connection or endeavor to make a connection and understanding with our own minds and bodies in such a way that we are housed in this mind and body in as comfortable way as possible, being as fit and healthy as possible, looking vibrant and being able to keep all our wits about us. But the very same environment that pleases us on a warm summery day can quickly become suffering on a winter's day. The very same person who soothes us with their kindness, 
can also become a source of suffering for us by the absence. Equally, the same body and mind that give us the strength and resilience to execute and achieve everything we want can also become the source of our pain and an obstacle to what we want. So this everything we're connected to can be an opportunity for growth, but equally a, creates a vulnerability to distress. <clears throat> that vulnerability is increased to the degree that we connect and connect and transform the connection into an attachment. Now, what do I mean by this? There is a difference between being connected to something and being attached. And I'm gonna illust illustrate this to you with an object. Now, I'm connected to this pain. Whilst I'm connected to this pain, I appreciate it. I can put it down whenever I want. I can write with it whenever I want uh, and I can put it away. I have no objection to it, accept it as it is. You know, I don't mind that's tough and hard. I don't mind that's inflexible. I don't mind that only does one thing, which is write on digital paper. Why? Because I have a relationship, but I'm not attached. Okay, so I can pick it up and put it down. Now, if I become attached, someone glues this to my hand, right? What happens? Have you noticed? It's become part of me. So now the position of my hand has changed because I've had to mold my hand around this pen to keep it in place because I'm now attached to this pen. And this attachment now means that the very same qualities that were helpful, this pen was firm, which you need for a pen, is now obstructing me because if I now try and pick up the glass next to me with this pen in my hand to be able to drink water, I can't. I have to now navigate how am I going to use my hand with no fingers available. Right, Because when we attach to something or someone, attachment means the two identities fuse into one. Okay, So the very same things that could be helpful about the object or the person become so incorporated in our own sense of who we are that they then become an obstruction. I will quickly forget that the ability of this pen to write on digital paper is something that's useful to me. And I will quickly start to see this very same pen that was my friend a few seconds ago and facilitated a lot of things for me as an obstacle. I may even start hating it, saying, get out of my hands when I'm the one who's holding on to it. Okay, so why am I raising this point about attachment versus like connection? In the Bhakti tradition, when Krishna is explaining um, and our wisdom texts, explain what should the relationship between the human self and the divine self be, the spiritual self. How can that divine self, that aspect of ours, which is joyful, which is always connected, never lonely, which has wisdom, which sees things for what they are and doesn't fear birth or death because birth or death are just not in our natural makeup. How do we integrate that with a sense of ourself a human sense of self, which does experience birth and death. We see it happen to the people around us. How does it? How do we relate when the human experience doesn't always know what's going on? We come under illusion. We make mistakes. We get cheated. And maybe sometimes we even cheat others. We forget things. Yeah, and sometimes we remember things in completely a different way to another person. Right? How does... The human self relate to the divine self when the human self isn't eternally full of joy. As we've heard, the very same things that give us pleasure can also make us upset. This is where Krishna kind of sums it up in the Bhagavad Gita. He gives Arjuna a very, very simple, simple way of living his life. He says, you don't have to stop doing, you don't have to stop being connected to people. You don't have to stop making your environment comfortable, your body healthy, doing your a duty, engaging in your purpose in this world. You don't have to stop doing any of those things. Just don't hold on to them so tightly that they disable you 
don't be so averse to them that you throw them away. Because sometimes when we come to a spiritual path, we start to become dismissive of our psychological health, our relationships, our physical sense of who we are. He says, actually, do what you need to do, but at the same time, nourish your spiritual sense of self. So actually, as your spiritual sense of self awakens more and more, it illuminates your mind with that eternal wisdom. You know, the Bhakti texts are really wonderful in explaining the mind as a bridge a two-sided bridge, one side which faces our transient or temporary identity, the ever-changing human ego, and one side which faces our divine ego, our divine sense of self. On the one hand, that side of the bridge which faces the transient sense of self is often filled with fear, anxiety, maybe anger, insecurity. Why? Because it's faced with temporariness the temporariness of everything. Whereas the side of the bridge that's connected with the divine self is illuminated, illuminated with the safety of joy, being eternally connected. And when the mind is more and more illuminated, as the soul is stronger, the whole bridge becomes illuminated so much through, so that it seeps through even into our human existence. We become divinely human. What has this all got to do with trauma? <laughs> You're probably wondering. I find people who've got, who've had very distressing experiences may feel some familiarity with this word trauma. And there may be others who think, well, nothing really major has happened to me. Why would the subject of trauma be of any interest? When our human sense of self is wounded, wherever it is, our social roles, our physical health, our psychological health, when it's wounded, it actually interferes, it can interfere very much, not just with our pursuit of uh, our spiritual practices, but also it can interfere with how safe we feel in spiritual communities. But it can also be a big distraction because wherever we feel unsafe, we tend to get busy trying to secure it, right? If you think your handbag is vulnerable to being stolen, you'll immediately, you'll, you'll find, if, even if you're talking to your friend, you're in deep conversation, someone walks past who clocks your bag and you get even a split seconds instinct that this person's after my bag. You will break your attention on your friend, no matter how engaging it is, no matter how much you love them, and your mind will go to, I've got to keep my bag safe. <clears throat> Why is everyday trauma something that's relevant to everyone? Regardless of whether you've had serious distressing experiences or not, in the blurb to this session, we talked about how we don't have to directly experience a distressing event for it to displace our sense of who we are. The minute any aspect of ourself feels displaced, invalidated, or under threat, it, it forces us to readjust who we think we are, doesn't it? So even what we're going through day to day None of us here may be directly involved. I don't know if any of you are, but maybe directly involved with what's going on in Israel or Ukraine and Russia, okay? <clears throat> you may not be directly involved with any of the challenges that are going on around the world, whether there's poverty, whether there's famine, whether there's war. You may not even be directly involved with loved ones who've been unfortunately subjected to distressing situations in their personal lives. But when we hear about and we watch these things without a spiritual lens, and what do I mean by without a spiritual lens? That's not just our spiritual lens, but when they're portrayed to us without a spiritual lens, it creates, um, it's like Velcro to stick to the human identity. It's like Velcro to the human identity. And it can very much, what we hear is what we become because what we hear Unless we can see and hear through spiritual vision, it very much tends to latch onto the human identity. And so what ends up happening is in getting busy in trying to find safety in our human identity, we end up getting distracted or maybe even blocked off from hearing uh, the broader vision, from trusting the broader vision. 
And it's really important to regain stability and have a healthy human ego because it actually facilitates regaining our spiritual ego. Because quite frankly, for the vast majority of our spiritual journey, we need these bodies and minds. For the vast majority of our spiritual journey, we need these bodies and minds to varying degrees, but we definitely need them. When our human ego, social, physical, psychological, is unhealthy, destabilized, traumatized, it affects our sense of self-worth. It can be the opposite and make us proud and arrogant as a defense mechanism. It can make us anxious or overthink or catastrophize again as a defense mechanism. When I speak to clients who are catastrophizing, they always ask me, why do I catastrophize? Catastrophizing is preparing your mind. Your mind prepares for the worst case scenario, thinking that if I create the worst case scenario in my mind, then when it happens, I'll know what to do. But all you've done is repeatedly put yourself in a situation that hasn't happened, traumatized yourself, reminded yourself that, oh, I am somebody who's under threat. I'm not really eternal. Oh, I am somebody who's lonely. I'm not really loved unconditionally. Do you see where I'm coming from? This, this help, Keeping the human ego healthy is different to putting too much attention on it. So what ends up happening is when our human ego is bombarded with continuous um, experiences, direct or indirect, of things that can wound us, things that can displace our sense of who we are, from understanding ourselves to actually being unconditionally loved and always connected to being vulnerable and always under threat. We react in a very mild version of what one might call the trauma response. We get busy trying to keep ourselves safe. So actually this, you know, I kind of call it human psychology versus divine psychology. Divine psychology, when you're in this space of feeling safe and connected, sharing is easy, caring is easy, cooperating is easy, isn't it? Right? Um, and this is the nature of the spiritual dimension. Joy is shared. Joy is not just individual. Human psychology is vulnerable. And when it's vulnerable, it ends up being divisive and protective because it's geared to protect the human sense of self. So these everyday traumas, even when we experience them indirectly, hear about them and talk about them, it can make it difficult for us to engage with our practices that help to nourish the very essence that will help us to turn what could be a trauma into an opportunity. And this is happening probably more than it's ever happened before because we are being bombarded information. Bombarded, we're not even fed it anymore. We are bombarded because it's quite intrusive the way it's in our inboxes, the way it's in our social media feed, the way actually our social media feeds are not necessarily curated by us. You know, there's a, an algorithm and an agenda by advertisers, by people who run the platforms to, to keep us hooked into the system hooked into the system, first through giving us stimuli that are addictive and make us hanker for more, and then keep us engaged by making us get into almost a mode of, okay, well, I'm just now kind of ignorantly going to literally just scroll. You know, mouth open, not really paying attention, but I'm here. I don't even know what time it is. I've forgotten that I even feel hunger. I need to go to the bathroom, but I can't get up from my bed or my chair to go to the bathroom. Okay, yes, doom scrolling, exactly. I forgot the lingo. <laughs> doom scrolling sends you into uh, this down the spiral of doom. I'm not saying all of this to scare you and say, hey, everybody, get off your social media feeds and don't ever talk to anybody about their pain because it's going to ruin your spiritual life. No, I'm just what I'm trying to build up here is that our society has almost created, um, not almost, it has created most of what we're exposed to to keep us ha either hankering for more or fearing the worst from happening, which are not our natural psychological states. 
They are not a divine psychological. So it makes it very, very hard. I notice spiritual seekers these days find it even more difficult in many ways to um, hear, to connect with uh, their practices, uh, to other spiritual seekers. So I'm hoping this session helps us to maybe take on a different perspective to things that might be making each of us feeling, uh, left us feeling vulnerable in today's world that we are much more aware of. My day, you could switch off the TV very easily. And actually they created good diversion for you to be able to switch off because if there was an advert, you just got up and had a break. We also only had four channels. I think by the time I was in my teens, the fourth channel was something new, okay? So there was less of this uh, being drip fed. It wasn't just right put in under our skin. And also these days, it's also shared at fiber optic speed, really fast. Blink your eyes and the thing in front of you has changed, okay? It's almost like you're just not allowed to connect with actual reality. So we are living in challenging times. But those who are born in today's challenging times will also find the solutions for today's challenges. Okay, so, you know, this is why it's so important. Children are um, so important for our future. And you as the mothers of children will be and are very, very important because you are their first teachers. So I'm going to do a little exercise with all of you. Okay, um, I'm going to ask you three questions, which I first want you to do on your own, because what I'd like us to do as a group is just you know, it's all well and good me rambling on here. But if I don't know where you're all at, I can't be of service to you. So I'd like to kind of gauge the temperature in our virtual room to see where people are at. Uh, I may be off the mark. You may all be blissfully viewing the world through transcendental vision and not really be affected by any of this. But if it is affecting you, let's work through it together. So these three questions... I'd like each of you to address them as an individual on your own piece of paper so you have the, the private space and time to reflect. And then we're going to break you up into groups to discuss whatever you feel comfortable discussing from your own reflections. Okay? Now, when I was talking about um, our human sense of self becoming wounded, by traumas or incidences that are dis distressing, whether we directly experience them, whether we indirectly experience them, or whether we have experienced them a long time in the, ago in the past and they're no longer relevant to us right now. The defenses that are created in the mind of overthinking, anxiety, catastrophe, essentially fear, or protecting ourselves, uh, by distancing ourselves from others through pride, maybe through arrogance, maybe even through envy. Because we often think, you know, we're, especially when we're feeling envious or jealous, we are hankering for something someone else has, but we create distance between us and them. Why? Because we're, we're kind of, our mind has not really understood that actually we admire something about them. So these things are like enemies of the mind. They don't allow the mind to be illuminated by this spiritual wisdom. They keep it in darkness. So uh, so the first thing I want you to address and ask yourself, and let's keep this as current as possible. Is there something, maybe this can be put in the chat room. So the first question is, is there something that you've recently heard about? So recently heard about, seen, or experienced that you find is taking up a lot of your thoughts and feelings. So you find yourself, Really, it's it's either coming up in, you know, you find yourself talking about it, you find yourself thinking about it, you find yourself worrying about it, you find yourself really um, giving it more time than you would ordinarily like to. Yeah. Is there something that you've recently heard about, seen or experienced that you find is taking up a lot of your thoughts and feelings? It could be something to do with your body and mind. It could be something to do with politics or the environment uh, it could be just something to do with your relationships anything it's personal to you and please write it down i know sometimes people type and sometimes people just think about it but there's a real power to writing things down our senses are paired and eyes and touch are paired just like taste and smell up head so eyes and touch up head so when we write 
as we see the words and we're touching the pen and writing things down, this um, neural pathway gets set up where we ingest and digest and process in a much deeper way. When it just stays in the mind as a thought, it quickly floats away in the ether. Is there something that you've recently heard about, seen or experienced that you find is taking up a lot of your thoughts and feelings? We've also written it in the chat. Thank you. Anybody. The next question is, which enemies of the mind do you feel predominate for you? Now, I've used this phrase, enemies of the mind, is because these, these feelings of uh, fear, feelings of hankering, uh, maybe pride, maybe isolating yourself, maybe like, like we mentioned envy. I mean, I just, I don't want to give too many words, but what I'd like you to reflect on is which vulnerable thoughts and feelings especially your feelings are coming up for you as a result identify them identify them how does it make you feel so when you're thinking about what you've heard or seen or experienced and it's taking a lot of your internal space of how does it leave you feeling I often say to people, when it comes to identifying your feelings, go with what comes first, because that's usually the easiest to talk about and connect with and unpack. We have to dig around for how we feel. We're overthinking it usually. And then last but not least, I want to explain this last one. The question is, can you identify what this may be connected to from your past? I don't want you to worry about that too much if that doesn't come to you. But the reason I've put this in as part of the question is because if we there's a reason why certain things we're drawn to certain things more than others right there'll be certain things you hear and it's like water's water off a duck's back it doesn't make you feel vulnerable it doesn't throw you off balance about who you are and what you want there's other things that immediately you hear a, a whisper of me like oh my gosh okay that's kind of knocked me for six often the things that really hit us it's because there's something that it resonates with it triggers within us maybe a, a previous experience which is similar so if you can identify this, great. If you can't, don't worry. You know, this can take time. But the second part, <clears throat> this last bit is what feelings might be protecting you from? What might your feelings be protecting you from? So for example, I gave you the example of catastrophizing. <clears throat> Sometimes people get into the habit of catastrophizing because they de develop that as a coping mechanism when they've gone through a difficult event before to prepare themselves for the next time it happens, especially where it's repeated. OK, so that's just an example. So we often latch on to unhealthy mindsets and <clears throat> emotions because we do believe that it's protecting us from something. So I want you to identify that. What do you think it's protecting you from? Because remember, the human psychology is there. It's set up to protect the human sense of self. But when it does it too much, it actually blocks us off from the divine sense of self. I'll give you a couple of minutes for those, that last bit. And then maybe we can give people um, 15 minutes in the breakout rooms to discuss with each other or 20 minutes, Dharma Therapy, I'm happy to let you decide. Yeah, well, we do have time for, for 20 minutes. So I'm going to pause the recording so that we can go into So thank you so much. I I, I could... You know, the tw full 20 minutes seem to be used, which means you must have been gay engaged in your conversations. Uh, there was a lot of food for thought there. I'm sure you also opened up your hearts and, and minds and 
you have reflections that are divinely inspired. Is there, before I, I kind of close with some thoughts on how we transform and also how we can transcend everyday trauma, uh, I wanna, would, if you don't mind, those who uh, are happy to share, maybe share, if some of you can share some reflections, if you just raise your hand, anything that came up for you in the group discussion that you feel like, you know, this, I really wanna share this. Lee has her hand up, please yeah. go ahead. Um, we had a nice mix in, in our uh, group. And I have to say one of the things that, that was my takeaway, when you were talking about holding your pen and how you were having to, to change yourself to hold that pen. And it's interesting uh, in relationships, how sometimes you can change yourself in a in an unhealthy way, but yet then we have women who change themselves in a healthy way and come to realize like how the relationship is different from their expectation, but still good. And then there was others that were just like, oh no, it's a relationship. So I'm going to turn myself, my, I'm speaking for myself here, turn myself into any contortion I need to, to make sure that this relationship stays. So it was really interesting on how we, how, what's a healthy change in a, a and in an unhealthy change in relationships. Thank you for sharing that. That's such a, a powerful and important uh, reflection, the difference between attachment and relationship. Because in a re relationship, there's two people. In our spiritual relationship, there's two people. There's Krishna and us, right? So there's always reciprocation. Now, if this pen was able to reciprocate, it would probably mold itself in a way that we'd cooperate, right? So that relationships, actually healthy relationships, stop us from becoming attached. It's easier to let go of someone who you have actual love and affection for. It's harder to let go when there's attachment, right? Because attachment means stuck. So I really like this. I, I like this distinction between relationship versus attachment. Attachment is very much a, like it feels like this unilateral connection, whereas relationship means there's two people. There's a, there's a interdependent dynamic. I think somebody else has their hand up. I, I saw Ambika uh, with her hand up, please. Ambika, Devi. Uh, I uh, yeah, so oh, so many things are coming and we had such a intense conversation in our breakout room. It was like so many things were happening that were, you know, kind of, I'll, I'll just mention without saying anybody's name, one of the participants was struggling with her, um, her children from a different man not getting along with her husband. And then there was another participant who was in that situation when she was you know, little, and this whole idea about the identity, you know, and in a relationship, if two people are identifying, or if there is the culture in the family where we identify ourselves with Krishna, or with God, or with some higher consciousness, then that it can become the connection rather than the attachment, and how important that is to continue cultivating that. Maybe I'm just jumping into uh, something in the further on but um yes the pen and <laughs> the pen and the hand analogy is so powerful <laughs> that, that's all thank you no you're not jumping ahead at all that is a uh, again another very very helpful reflection that the people that we surround ourselves with certainly inform our worldview and uh, our vision and how we how we see things whether we see distressing events as as uh, something that destabilizes us or does it stabilize us more uh, so thank you not jumping ahead at all thank you for that anyone else with any reflections it's so wonderful to hear your deep thoughts martin did you put your hand up very quickly no you're just waving it i i don't think so but uh, for me um we basically kind of stayed with question one somehow because it's a very uh, intense time for me personally. I mean, for me and many other people, everyone. I'm Jewish and I have half my family in Israel. So and this week, one of my uh, cousin's sons was killed in Gaza. So um, it is um, it is hard in those moments to... Um, to really connect with uh, a higher sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, 
because we are pulled down by our own reality. And we, you know, as a Jew, I carry so I'm sorry, my, my dog is barking a lot. Um, I, you know, I carry millennia of uh, trauma. So, um, so it is, uh, it is a uh, very, very hard right now. And mm -hmm. uh, as I told, um, Dana, uh, at the beginning, I just came back from India from a pilgrimage with Raghunath and, uh, you know, these events happened right beforehand. So it was also difficult there to kind of compartmentalize and, uh, be able to be there because what can I do, but we can do, we have voices. Uh, mm -hmm. it's not just about, as far as I'm concerned about praying and calling on Krishna, because that's not enough. Um, and, uh, the silence is overwhelming and deafening, uh, and there is a lot of mixing of a lot of things. Um, and, um, and so it's, it's not an easy moment to really, uh, believe that the higher sphere, which we, we, I mean, I, I completely believe there is, um, can really um, intervene. Uh, I do believe there is a power in prayer, but it's not enough. Uh, we are required to be present and take action. And action can be raising a voice, um, embracing you know, each other and finding our humanity. I just want to illustrate what I'm saying because I I came across um, a clip of an Israeli man whose mother-in-law was murdered in front of her, his children and his wife. Um, subsequently, his wife and children were abducted. And instead of saying, I want to kill them, he said, if I were in front of a Hamas um, man, I would embrace him. That takes a lot of courage. So there is humanity and there is hope, but it is hard in those moments to find that hope mm. and to um, to uh, stay grounded on all sides. I'm not, you know, I'm talking from my own personal history, experience, my identity and everything else. So I can, you know, I'm just giving that that. So, um, these questions are very timely, but they are really, really, really hard. And um, that's it. Sorry. <laughs> First of all, can I just say my prayers, good wishes uh, from the heart, really for you and your family and everything that you're going to. And also thank you for your bravery, for being honest and open. Uh, and really clearly saying that actually when stuff happens, it's difficult to ignore and for very good reasons it can distract us from nourishing ourselves and sometimes those reasons are for out of compassion it's not always fear and uh, wanting to isolate or anger often it's out of compassion that I feel like I need to do something and very much reminds me of uh, Krishna's conversation with Arjun Arjun's the greatest warrior he's on a battlefield the greatest conversation of compassion happens in the middle of a battlefield before a war is about to break out. And Krishna doesn't tell Arjun to stop fighting and just go and pray. In fact, that was Arjun's suggestion. Can I just go and sit and meditate under a tree? And uh, Krishna explains to him, like, you're a warrior. It's your service to humanity to protect them from kings who are exploiting them. Now, you can either do this in a way where you're attached and hanker for the results, which isn't going to help you. Or you can be averse to doing your duty, which isn't going to help you. You can do your duty of protecting others as a service to humanity, which is out of the three options, the best. But one even higher than that is turn your uh, fighting into an offering to me. So our action can be as powerful as prayer, depending on who and how we connect uh, to divinity. So... This is this kind of brings me to and there's some questions in the group which I do want to address, but as part of the QA. This session was about transforming and transcending everyday trauma. And the transformational part, I just wanted to share a couple of things that you may find helpful 
that when you are coming across distressing uh, events, there are those things which are within our circle of influence, direct circle of influence, where we can have a human, we can in intervene on a human level. And then there's those which are outside of our circle of influence, where we may be able to influence, but more from a distance. It's not really we can do so much about it. So in terms of transforming everyday trauma, rather before we even try and transcend it, um, first of all, I think a really important thing is really to curate what we hear and discuss. Is what I'm about to hear, is it something and discuss, where am I in it? Is it something that I can, should be hearing about and discussing? Is it important? Is it relevant? Um, is it something that I have a duty to do something about? and the ability to do something about. And where there's duty and ability, then one has to, with intelligence, see how they express their compassion. But often, as I, as I expressed before, because we are so bombarded with so many things, we're often at a distance and things are out of our locus of control. And actually transforming it may be more about, <clears throat> yes, I'm not saying just go and pray, Krishna didn't tell Arjun to do that, but also seeing how can we be of benefit from the outskirts? Uh, how can we change our vision? And one thing that can be helpful is this attitude of understanding that the hand behind the pain, the ultimate hand behind the pain, is a hand that's coming from a heart of love. You know, Krishna's love for us is unconditional. It is un uninterrupted. It is unalloyed and in our favor. Which is why the definition actually of pure devotional service is, is also the same. When our love for him, it matches the quality of his love for us. Uninterrupted, unalloyed, it's consistent, unmotivated by other things. So when we understand that, actually, you know, there's a loving hand behind the pain. It doesn't stop the situation from being painful. But it doesn't displace our sense of identity so much. It actually can enable us to act and make some very difficult decisions and be a real source of strength. I'll give you a very simple example. If you've ever had a splinter and asked your mother or your father or a friend to remove it, that splinter hurts. It's a tiny little thing. It causes trauma to your skin. OK, tiny little thing. If you've ever seen a child get a splinter, I mean, I still act like a baby when I get a splinter. <laughs> it's like somehow this tiny little thing caused me more pain than anything else. You know, like, oh, get out, get out, get out. And you're there, you know, but this, a lot of parents, I see they come with a pin, a safety pin. My mum used to remove our splinters with a safety pin. She knew she had to pierce the surface of the skin before she could get to the splinter, especially if it went very deep. But I trusted her because I knew the pain she's about to cause me is going to remove something that's deep-rooted and causing me pain and not visible to me so clearly because I'm just distracted by the pain. So I allowed her to cause me more pain to prevent a deeper pain. Now, I'm not sitting here saying we should all just be rolling around subjecting ourselves to pain and trauma. I'm actually just really trying to get us to understand that hearing and curating what we discuss and what we hear is our way of setting also a healthy boundary between us and the stuff we're bombarded by, okay? And just trusting the hand behind the pain as we do here in Curate, because we all have different services. We're all mixing in different environments. And as we mix in different environments, as we engage with the world as compassionate beings, we are gonna hear different things to different degrees and be involved to different degrees. But for our own vision, that understand that there is a loving hand behind the pain can be extremely empowering. And that's where I think Ambika's point that if our close and loved ones also have spiritual visions, the people we trust, it helps to strengthen that. How we receive what we hear trumps the mood of the person who's speaking it. Right? It talks about this even in our sacred text, Srimad Bhagavatam, that actually when somebody is speaking, what manifests from what they're speaking, the result of what the words that they say is not only dependent on the motive of the person speaking, it's very much dependent on the purity 
and the clarity of the person who's listening. Because ultimately behind everything, who's communicating with us? Krishna. Because Krishna is trying to communicate with us through everyone and everything. But are we listening out? So curating and what we hear and what we discuss. The second uh, aspect I wanted to share was, I guess it just it, it builds on the little exercise we did. Work through the untrue constructs that previous trauma might have created. For example, all our past experiences leave us with an internal dialogue. You know, internal dialogue about our physical sense of self. We're tall, we're beautiful, we're not tall, we're not beautiful, whatever it is. But they also can leave us with dialogues around uh, things like nobody loves me, I'm always excluded, or there's always something, particularly trauma, there's always something I've got to protect myself from, right? Just even hearing the news, there's always something to protect ourselves from. Adverts, there's always, you've got to get insurance for everything because there's got to be a just-in-case plan for everything because you might lose it all, right? Your money's going to run out. So this, 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 this mood of um, when we do exercises like this, even if it's something like your financial situation is really, maybe for some of you, it's, that's what's been playing on your mind a lot. But a lot of that's been created by what we hear. There isn't enough. There isn't enough. Yeah. Your standard of living has to be of a certain level. You've got to match your friends. There's not enough to eat. There's not enough. This. I remember when COVID kicked off, I couldn't believe that things that are run out of the supermarket were toilet roll and water. You know, this, 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 it was, it was the, the, this, and people's judgment of what's going to run out was also fed by what was being reported on. There's not enough. There's not enough. There's not enough. So work through untrue constructs that previous trauma and even everyday trauma doesn't mean that you've had to have some severe incident happen to you. Even everyday stuff has created trauma. Again, back to that word, things that have destabilized your true sense of who you are. Okay. So this is all to do with transform transforming trauma into an opportunity, right? Trusting the hand behind the pain, working through it. Because we want to break those myths that the mind, when it's not on our side, is telling us, right? Because they're completely unsynchronized with the truth. They're the opposite. They're in opposition. That's why we talk about those things as enemies of the mind. Um. There are lots of other tips, but I want to focus just on three because I find if you give people more than three, then it just kind of disappears. The third tip I'm going to give is about trans, uh, transcending trauma. How do we transcend? When I think of this word transcend, it means rise above, right? Rise above our usual constructs of time, space, laws of action and consequence, okay? Um, anything that we think are laws that govern how the mind and body and societal roles move in this time and space. That's what transcend means, okay? How do we transcend the um, way our mind and body get bent out of shape by the things that we hear, by the things that we see, by the things that we talk about? This view, this illuminated view, the mind's illuminated view by the strength of the soul, that transcendent, that extreme bird's eye vision. If you were to go to outer space and look at Earth, it would look very different to when you're at ground level. Okay, this is transcendental vision. You zoom out. This is really, really nourished by the restorative power of calling on Krishna with his very, very nurturing names. We are so lucky to be able to call unconditional loving mood the loving mood of divinity on a first name basis the most loving the most affectionate the person who stays with us all the time the most powerful calling his name we are we're all on a first name basis with the supreme personality of god i mean that's something that should make all of us feel a bit like huh okay what do i have to be scared of I, I'm I'm on a first name basis with a person who arranges everything, right? You go anywhere and if the most powerful person there, you're on a first name basis with them. Don't you walk into the place like you own it, <laughs> right? So it's an empowering feeling. It doesn't come from ego. It comes from our divine ego. It comes from Krishna, okay? So this restorative 
restorative power of his name is so strong. You know, I often talk about the vaccinating effect of the holy name, the antibiotic effect of the holy name. But I'm really recently been relishing the restorative effect. When your body feels down and beaten, when your mind feels down and beaten, when it feels like the world is completely forgotten about you and nobody understands you. There's that battery within ourselves that comes from deep within, which is actually always connected, whether we believe it or not, to Krishna's divine love. And when we call him, it's like flicking a switch. Okay, the super soul becomes our super friend. And our super friend charges up our battery with his love just by calling him. Even if we distract you, like, oh, Krishna, really, I'm not calling you with quality because my mind's here and my body's hurting and nobody loves me and I feel like I'm crying for really materialistic reasons. Doesn't matter. Please just help me. Just, I want to put all of this away so I can just call you properly. Just have some time with you. Just be present. He'll respond because it's a relationship. If we want to transcend, trauma recharge our batteries with a restorative power krishna's beautiful name i'm going to stop there with what i'm sharing and take some of your uh, questions and your sharings and your realizations yes thank you uh, so much shakti uh, so we do have about three minutes or so before we have our, our dear rukmini uh share about finishing up for our next month. So does anybody have any quick reflections or we actually had a question come up in the chat. Yeah, should I address that quickly? Yeah, if you can, that would be great. It just if you could read it aloud just so that we can. I will do recording. it's a it's an anonymous question and it's in two parts and it may take up our full three minutes. So forgive me. Um so the question was will you please speak on unhealed trauma as a blocking to bhakti and used as spiritual bypass. So if I can say that very Brief, just respond to that very br briefly. Whenever any sense of ourself, again, come back to trauma, is destabilized, the first thing we want to do is become safe again. Okay? And so spiritual life, spiritual practices, spiritual communities can present an opportunity to find that safety. But the very reason we went through some of those challenges, one of the reasons is so we can also let go of unhealthy attachments. And when we don't, work through those and we just bypass the the things that we actually probably need to sort out in order to be able to connect with our spiritual practices and spiritual relationships on a deeper level then what ends up happening is we end up we actually can't spiritually bypass we can't take a shortcut to surrender there's no shortcut to surrender krishna will force us to say hey you know you start walking towards me or you're bringing all this baggage with you you're going to have to put it down at some point. Um, so in one sense, I also don't worry too much when I see people trying to spiritually bypass. Um, they're trying to find some safety. And if we can lovingly out of compassion, help them to find avenues to understand that we accept you and we love you. Can we help you put this bag down at the same time? Because you can't ignore it. And then that can be helpful. Uh, and then the other thing is, uh, the last thing they asked was, uh, I personally struggle to accept help of psychiatric medical medication as an instrument of Krishna to help me heal. It would be nice if you can speak a bit on this matter. Our body and mind is our vehicle and our instrument of service to Krishna. That is, everything we have is an instrument. And healing our body and mind so to optimize our offering is like a sadhana it's a spiritual practice and so whatever tools krishna sends us in order to regain uh, our human health to a point where we are able to serve whether that's focusing on our chanting whether that's reading writing hearing whatever it is caring for others caring for your families it's um it's coming from that same person. It may be looking like it's created by man or a human, but actually ultimately all intelligence, knowledge, remembrance, forgetfulness comes from Krishna. So whatever tools Krishna has offered us, we have to use our intelligence. It helps to use our intelligence to just see what can I do as part of my healing sadhana to enhance all of my other uh, sadhana. 
Um, and, and I'm sorry, I just want to make a last point about this spiritual bypass thing, is that there's a benefit to everything we experience. Benefit to everything. If we can focus on that, uh, that what was the benefit of what I experienced, that can help us move away from spiritual bypass and actually engage with the spiritual process much more as well as the healing process. So I think it's time to hand over. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Shiti Shakti, David Dasi. We, as we can tell, like everybody has even more that they want to get to. So as always, we'll probably need to invite you again. And also we want to remind everyone that we can continue these conversations on our WhatsApp groups. I shared the links and I'll share them again. But now we have our dear Rukmini Walker, who's going to share with us uh, about our next Urban Davy. Hare Krishna, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Chidi Shakti. I think once again, this was amazing. So many uh, treasures, so many jewels of takeaway for all of us. So the one I just picked up is that there's a benefit to the, to each of those experiences. So we have to really look carefully what, what is the benefit um, for, from those even painful experiences. So, so helpful. Thank you, Chidi Shakti, absolutely wonderful. So I just wanted to mention that our next, please write on your calendars, if you would, our next Urban Devi Sangha will be December 10th, Sunday, December 10th. And Sita Devi Dasi from Mumbai will be speaking to us. She's also a, a medical person. She's a dentist, but she's very active in helping and uplifting the women, um, the village women in the area of Govardhan Eco Village. So Here's her topic. She's saying spiritual women empower um, other women. So that's beautiful. She says Vaishnavis truly are empowered by Krishna as they can give direction to all women. They are the true leaders the society needs today. But are we recognized as leaders? Are we empowered within our society to be the leaders? What needs to be done to claim our role and position as spiritual leaders in the Krishna consciousness movement. So let's hear what she has to say next December 10th. And please come back. Please mark your calendars. It's wonderful to be with all of you from all over the world. It's so interesting. You know, um, Karuna Shakti is in South Africa and uh, uh, Sharanagati is is in uh, uh, Finland. Not Sharanagati. I messed up her name. But anyway, so many wonderful uh, Vaishnavis and thank you so much for being here. It's a it's a great honor for all of us to to be together with, with all of you. And um, thank you for joining. Yes, Sara Grahi from Finland. I had her name wrong. I love that name. Yes, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Damodar Priya, for hosting. <laughs>